Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the Azapo Limpopo online political education series. Uh, today, we are tackling the topic of uh, politics and economics of, econ uh, of, of the coronavirus. My guest uh, this afternoon is uh, Professor Monden Dwasa. He does not need any introduction when it comes to uh, these matters. Uh, he is um, a specialist and a professor at the University of South Africa. Uh, he is going to be talking to us about uh, you know, the coronavirus, looking at its politics and, uh, the, and, and the related economics. Um, he is uh, here with us um, uh, this afternoon. So um, by those a few words, I would like to welcome Professor Monden Dwasa and Azapo Stolwald and the BCM Keida. Uh, Comrade Monde. Uh, thank you, Comrade. Let us start by doing the right thing, which is <laughs> to share the, the, this uh, file. I hope it's not going to give us problems. Oh, yeah. Um, start sharing. Um, I think it's this one. Okay, whilst uh, he is uh, setting up, um, just to alert you that we are live on Facebook on the Azapo Limpopo uh, Facebook platform as well as the Azapo Eastern Cape Facebook platform. And you will also find us on the national Azapo uh, platform. So all of those uh, three platforms uh, are available for you to engage with us. Can you see it? I can, I can see your presentation there. Okay. All right, uh, you can take the floor. I'm just going to show for a while for a bit and then start. Okay. Um, is everybody ready now? Yeah, yeah, we can we can go for it. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, uh, first of all, for the invitation. Um, uh, it's really not an invitation just an invitation to me. It's, uh, it's, an, it's an excellent opportunity for mm. me to share ideas with people who are likely to consider them and not dismiss them uh, outright um, because of uh, like-mindedness. Mm. Um, I um, what I'm going to do today is basically to share information with like-minded people and also to share opinions which may be correct or not correct. So I'm not presenting solutions to anything. I am all presenting any truths, um, but I am presenting opinions which I hope will spark a debate and important uh, and a constructive discussion. So I'm really very thankful for, um, for the invitation. The, um, the title that was given to me, um, that I see for the workshop, the title I see for the workshop is uh, the politics of coronavirus, uh, of the pandemic rather, I think. Um, but I think what, I, or what uh, I'm going to do, that's why I'm giving it this uh, a title also, the the virus itself and its social and political impact. <clears throat> I think that we will be able to discuss the ramifications, social and political ramifications of the virus if we understand um, what the virus is all about in the first place. So I'm going to start talking about the, the, na the, the nature of the disease itself. And I shall talk about um, the medical interventions um, that have been offered globally, and then talk about the politics of the pandemic, um, uh, uh, both uh, global and national uh, 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 politics. Uh, but I shall, in the 
again focus on the response by South Africa to the pandemic. Um, as I said, I'm not uh, offering truths, I'm offering only a basis for discussion. Um, so I'll start by talking about the, the immune system because I think it's important uh, for us. It's not just the politics of it, but it's also for our own personal benefits to understand the, um, the, 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 the virus and the disease itself. So I shall talk about the pathogenesis of the virus, in other words, how, does, how the virus causes disease. And then I will talk about vaccination because vaccination is the most important thing now that is uh, on the table that's offered by the world to deal with the, with the, with the coronavirus. So the immune system obviously is something that is everywhere on our bodies. Um, uh, but there are specific um, uh, organs and specific uh, tissues which specialize in the immune system. But as you can imagine, it must be all over. The immune system is designed to protect us from the environmental stresses, um, um, not only infections, but also um, 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 stresses that cause injuries of all sorts. To the um, to the body, even cancer is uh, is protected, is controlled by the immune system, although it is not necessarily through infection. The skin is a very important uh, part of this protective mechanism. Of course, the skin is the physical barrier between us and the environment, and that's very important. Uh, it's not only uh, uh, acting as a physical barrier; it is also armed with uh, important um, um, uh, you know, uh, um, apparatus, uh, uh, immune apparatus to protect us from uh, from, from from infections. Um, so, as you can see here, um, all these uh, what call uh, uh, organs and tissues that are indicated here are everywhere. The bone marrow is very important because this is where. Um, this is basically the main factory of uh, what call of all cells that are circulating in the blood. They are all are uh, in the bone marrow, and they're in the in bone marrow in their earliest stages of uh, development. So, for instance, all the immune cells, the white blood cells, different types of white blood cells in circulating in our blood are in the bone marrow, their ancestor is in the bone marrow, their main progenitor is in the bone marrow, and it's just one cell, but that's where we can divide into different types of cells. So it's called stem cell. So the bone marrow is the seat of stem cells, uh, and those stem cells will eventually end up in the blood as different types of them. Uh, so the bone marrow is very important. That's why sometimes it is transplanted from patient to patient. The other important part uh, of the immune system is the thymus. Thymus is um, uh, right behind the sternum. The sternum causes the middle of your chest. Um, I don't know whether I can see the arrow here, but it's this white little thing here is the thymus gland. Thymus is important because this is where the maturation of T cells, the subtype of white cells, which is very important for killing. Um, uh, organisms such as viruses and bacteria. Those T cells are also important for influencing the development of antibodies. The thymus is very important because it is largest in young people. And uh, by the time you reach the age of 65, the thymus is almost gone, finished, you can see it. Um, it, it shrunk. So people at that age, at the age of 65 or so, um, have got a weaker immune system, and such people, in fact, uh, cannot be helped um, effectively even by vaccination. So that's why I'm mentioning it's a very important um, uh, uh, organ, and that is why people at the late stages of their lives do not have a strong immune system because of this little thing here um, uh, behind the, the sternum. <clears throat> The other part of the immune system that's very important is the mucous membranes. These mucous membranes, basically the epithelial tissues, 
Tissues are tissues that um, cover all cavities of the body. Um, your alimentary system from your mouth all the way is covered by epithelia. Your blood, uh, what call is in tubes, which are covered by epithelia. The air passages from your nostril, as you can see here, all of that is epithelia. These tissues are very important because they form another barrier other than the skin that protects us from the environment. And they're particularly important because we inevitably have to introduce things into these epithelia because of our lives. For instance, we take food. The food is an environmental uh, uh, problem for the epithelial tissue, and it introduces things into our system. Epithelial tissue is important to make sure that whatever comes with the food does not end up in your circulation. So they, the epithelial tissues all over the body are armed with, uh, with a, a, what called um, a immediately acting immune uh, machinery, which we shall talk about later. I'm mentioning this thing because it's important. Um, if you notice this person here uh, from the nostrils, that's where all of that, uh, that is the, the darker print there is um, um, a, a epithelial tissue um, that goes all the way into uh, uh, the throat and you can see it converges also with the mouth going down. This is the upper respiratory tract, in fact. And this is where the virus enters the, the, the body. This is, this is the only known um, uh, vehicle for viral entry to infect a person. And, um, and then it ends up obviously in the lower respiratory tract, which is the lungs. And um, this is important because that is why the wearing of masks is so important because if you can prevent the virus from entering here, there is no way you're gonna get infected. You won't be infected by it being in your mouth or in your, anywhere in your body. If you can prevent it from entering your mouth and your nostrils, then you can't get sick uh, of the virus, even if you are in an environment where it is. And uh, it's also important to note this because it seems that the virus spends some time in the upper respiratory tract before it goes to the lower respiratory tract. Remember, it has uh, um, 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 about 14 days um, uh, uh, to, to cause a disease. Um, sorry. Um, so, if you can prevent it at this stage, that is why uh, the practice that um, uh, indigenously people started doing ufuta or steaming was so important because if you steam, first of all, the virus dies at 28 degrees, which is low, a temperature lower than the, the temperature that we use in the shower. So, and if, if the virus is in your skin, on your face, anywhere, when you shower, it should die, most of it. If you steam your face and inhale hot steam, it's going to die. Hot steam is boiling water, and it's going to reduce any viral load that might be in the upper respiratory tract. By so doing, you reduce the amount of virus that can go to the lower respiratory tract. So steaming is very important uh, for this reason. So that is just the, the structural arrangements for the immune system. The immune system itself has two arms. Um, there are two arms. One arm is called the innate immune system. The other one is called the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is the immune system that kicks in immediately when you get an infection. And um, you get when you get infections, generally you find you get inflammation. And you can see that if you, if for instance, you get an infection on your on your skin, let's say on your on your on your on your hand, you will see there will be redness. Later, that redness will become a whitish, and and then you know it, it becomes purulent after that. So that is the immune system, basically the innate immune system. It acts immediately. You get an an injury either by a pathogen or by physical injury. All the cells of the immune systems will be harnessed by the body and be drawn to that area. And that's part, part cause of the redness because cells have been attracted from other parts of the body to that area 
to cause uh, what's called the inflammation there, which is the white blood cells and also other uh, other, other red blood cells also get uh, what called accumulated. And what happens during the immune system is the production of local hormones, which directly attack the, the virus and also change your body. For instance, when you get an infection by a flu virus, as you know, you immediately get a, a fever. The fever is caused by the local hormones that are produced by your body, uh, uh, particularly the uh, gamma interferon. It will raise the temperature of your, of, your, of your body so that the virus will die. It raises as another mechanism to kill the virus because viruses cannot withstand high temperature. So the, all of that is harnessed by the innate immune system. It acts immediately and it's supposed to kill the virus. Later, you get what you call adaptive immune system. Now, the innate immune system is, is fast, but it does not, it's not too specific. It does not distinguish between the types of viruses or the types of bacteria or the types of fungi, but it can distinguish whether it's a virus or a bacteria or a fungi. So it's got a limited specificity. Adaptive immunity is different because what it does is to give you specificity. It not only kills a virus, it kills a specific type of virus. It's very specific. And additionally, it has memory. So it can remember after a while, if you become uh, healthy and a year or so later, or uh, maybe a few months later, the virus attacks you again, the immune system this time will immediately uh, act, act just almost like the, in, the innate immune system, it will faster. When it starts, when you get the infection for the first time, Adaptive immunity takes about two weeks to develop. And, um, uh, uh, but once it's there, it can stay longer. The innate immunity kicks in immediately, but it dies off later. But the two arms of the immune system work together. The innate immune system also influences the, the, the development of the adaptive immune system. I'm mentioning all of this because uh, uh, it's, it's what is the basis of vaccination. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk now about viruses themselves. How do they uh, um, um, uh, attack us? Viruses can uh, attack us in different ways. They can attach on the membrane of the cell. So here we've got this big structure uh, with the right the red line, which is the cell. Red line is the cell, and the virus is the thing with the black spikes around it. Those spikes are very important for the viruses. They are proteins, and um, the inner circle below those spikes is the covering of the, of the virus. And this is important to know because this covering of the virus, that round circle, is basically fat. It's just lipids. Um, that is why it is so easy to kill the virus by by, by heating, because you can imagine if you hit the fat, it's going to melt and, you know, it, and, and, and the virus will die. Inside that fat is the key part of the, of the virus, which is the genome of the virus. That is the part that is really a problem for us. And if the virus is able to introduce that into the cells, then we cannot prevent it uh, easily. So the virus uses uh, uh, that uh, the, these spikes, these uh, black spikes there, to enter into the cells. And viruses can enter cells by attachment. They can attach to the cells using specific receptors. They can fuse with the membrane. The one that you see here is almost like a fusion. It's a fuse. It, it, it's fusing with the membrane. There's no particular receptors binding it. Or they can inject the genetic material. The virus will be sitting outside, you just inject the genetic material and that's it. Um, so they've got various types, various ways of entering cells. This particular uh, a virus, uh, the, the, the coronavirus is, uses the, the first type, the one using receptors. And these are examples of viruses uh, that use receptors. The flu virus, influenza virus, 
poliovirus uses that, HIV also uses uh, receptors. Everybody knows the receptors of HIV because that is the CD4 receptors that you find on white blood cells. People know because people always talk about CD4 count and that's because CD4 count basically tells us the amount of white blood cells you, uh, you, you have in your body. And those are the receptors that the virus uses to enter the cell. So uh, once it's inside the, the, the cell, then the virus releases the genetic material. And the genetic material that's released by the virus is going to then cause the, the infection. Maybe let's go back to that. If you, if you notice, <clears throat> this, this the red thing there is the genetic material. Once the virus puts the genetic material inside your cell, then it takes over the machinery of the cell to produce more viruses. And then it will produce many, many viruses with, within that cell and then repackage that, uh, those viruses. And then it releases them outside that cells to go to other cells and it starts infecting and that's how it will spread around your body. Um, the, the coronavirus does the same thing. The coronavirus has got this spike protein, which are these uh, protrusions that you see the red ones outside. These spike proteins, it uses to enter um, uh, uh, your cell. And the receptor for the coronavirus is called an ACE2 receptor. It's um, an interesting um, uh, uh, receptor because this receptor is, um, has been found to to interact with nicotine and the many publications that are emerging <clears throat> which show that this uh, receptor interacts with, with nicotine. It's a, it's a complex receptor system um, um, which has got uh, positive and negative uh, uh, mediators uh, aspects of it um, um, in, in terms of how it interacts with the, with the, with the, with the body. And um, a lot of work has been done to, to look at how smoking um, uh, impacts uh, what's called uh, coronavirus uh, infections. <clears throat> and so far, um, all uh, 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 results that uh, show from research that's been done show that smoking actually does not have any impact on, uh, on, on, on the pathogenesis of the coronavirus that in fact it may be uh, what's called an impediment because nicotine apparently binds also to these receptors. If nicotine binds to the receptors, it means that the virus cannot bind to those receptors, which means the virus will find it more difficult to, uh, to attach, to, to infect a person who has got a high content of uh, uh, nicotine circulating in their system. The other thing that has been shown is that the, um, uh, the, the nicotine, um, uh, now I'm talking about nicotine, not smoking, nicotine down regulates um, the, this uh, uh, receptor system so that you, our cells of uh, smokers have got less activity of the ACE2 receptor. Which should also, which could mean also that in those situations, the virus could help. But this research, this research at the moment should be taken with some caution because majority of it comes from review, systematic reviews of, uh, of papers, um, but some extent experimental uh, uh, evidence is also emerging. So it is interesting that um, uh, uh, smoking um, is, 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 is regarded as uh, one of the uh, problems for uh, infection in South Africa. Now, adaptive immunity, which is the immunity that I say is the most important, but it's the one that takes longer to develop in the body, mm -hmm. has got uh, these important uh, response phases. There's the initial response where it is uh, catapulted in the body after a lag period. So after first exposure, it is not there. If you see that there's a, a lag period and then it rises. Uh, up, um, including the, the T cells. And then, and then weeks later, 
uh, then there's another uh, round that comes up, which is more protective immunity. And that immunity can stay for a very long time. And then it will have memory so that you will be protected for years to come. Um, and this slide shows here the different uh, stages in terms of days. So you can see that the innate immunity will be acting for the first five or so days after infection you will be relying mostly on the innate immunity for your uh, uh, survival against an infection by a, 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 a virus or a bacteria or a, a, or a fungus. You will require, by that time, there is virtually no adaptive immunity that's developing. The first uh, development of adaptive immunity is influenced by the T cells. The T cells are an interface between the innate immunity and adaptive immunity. They are active in the innate immunity, but they're also very active in promoting the development of adaptive immunity. But the key thing you want for an adaptive immunity is the development of antibodies. These antibodies, as you can see, they can take up to two weeks to reach a phase. And the other important thing about antibodies is that their development does not necessarily mean that you get an immunity because it depends what type of antibodies that you get. For example, people develop antibodies against HIV, but they do not get protected by the antibodies they develop from HIV because um, HIV does not make what you call neutralizing uh, antibodies, enough neutralizing antibodies. What you need is the development of neutralizing antibodies. And that's what all the different vaccination strategies are doing, is to develop a vaccine that can produce not just antibodies, but neutralizing antibodies. And this is what is difficult. This is the major problem with vaccine development, to get those particular antibodies to be developed. And unfortunately, there is no much way of uh, doing it. A lot of it is, 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 is by chance. OK, so now let's talk about vaccines, what vaccines are. <clears throat> And it's important because um, uh, you probably know that uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, resistance around the world um, against vaccines. People do not like vaccines. So you will see perhaps when we talk now why people would not, do not like vaccines. So there are different types of vaccines. Um, uh, you get what you call inactivated versions of the pathogenic virus. In this case, you take the virus, for instance, you take the coronavirus, and then you inactivate it. In other words, you make it less virulent. And um, you can do this by slowly heating it, or you can do it by uh, growing it through many passages in the laboratory on cells, on, 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 on cell lines, until it becomes weak. And then you inject it on the, on, in, in the patient. Um, so you're hoping that it's going to stay in the patient and in, uh, uh, stimulate the formation of uh, antibodies without you know, causing disease. You can imagine the, 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 the dangers of that, that you do not have sometimes complete um, confidence that you have inactivated the virus completely. So, but these are unfortunately the vaccines that have been um, there for a very, very long time. Um, and have, some of them have been successful, but uh, with some dangers. The polio virus, for instance, one of those. Live attenuated viruses, these ones are alive, they're not weakened, but they have been um, uh, attenuated. In other words, they've been uh, truncated, their genetic material has been truncated so that to prevent the key virulence vector in it. So it's the same virus, but it's been genetically um, uh, weakened, uh, but it's still alive. Um, so the problem, of course, with that is that what if the weakening is not uh, uh, complete? So, um, and then you get uh, subunit uh, vaccines. Um, these are uh, vaccines that also use um, uh, vectors now, but you take a virus that is known not to cause a disease in humans, and uh, you insert in that virus a 
gene from the virus that causes the disease. And so that the, the non-pathogenic virus becomes a vehicle, a vector for the gene that comes from the pathogenic virus. And um, the, then you introduce that into the patient and you are hoping that within the patient, the, uh, the, the gene that comes from the pathogenic virus will be converted into protein and then it will, the body will think that it's got the pathogenic virus and start making antibodies to that virus. Other very new um, uh, strategies for vaccines um, uh, have, to, have emerged. And this one called the messenger RNA virus is the first time really that it's come to clinical trials. There's no licensed virus like this one. And strangely, that is the uh, vaccine that is currently on top of all the others. In this one, you take the viral RNA and you introduce not all of it. In this case, they take the, the viral RNA that encodes that spike protein you saw on the on the on the coronavirus, that red thing that I was showing you earlier, on the outside of the virus. So this messenger RNA will be introduced into your body. And inside your body, it will make that protein that is on the surface of the virus. And then the body will think that it's got the virus and then will make an antibody against that virus. Similar strategy can be used for uh, DNA, or we can make recombinant proteins. So you can take a protein, for, uh, a gene from the virus, convert into a protein, and then you can uh, inject that protein into uh, what you call into the patient's body. And then the body will make uh, 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 antibodies against that protein. So there are many strategies by which uh, vaccines are made and they can be uh, um, uh, successful before. There are currently more than 200 vaccine, vaccines that are being developed globally. And this one on this page, uh, the one Moderna Therapeutic, at the time I was to put the slides, um, the one I've got here was on phase one, but it's actually, this is the mRNA virus. It's the first uh, time that the mRNA virus has been, has been used. Um, so it's, it's a major, major uh, a, a, a campaign around the world to produce vaccines because people believe that you can deal with this virus by getting vaccines. Vaccine development is a very, very long process. Uh, we can't, we won't talk, even talk about exploratory years because nobody can, can tell what they are. They can be very short or can be, in this case, it was very quick. There was no real exploration because the virus was identified in China very quickly, um, and this genomic uh, what call was uh, a sequence was uh, was published. So there was no uh, a lot of uh, exploration that was done there. But sometimes it can take years before people even know what the problem is. You know, like in the case of HIV, you know, it could take years before people even know what is causing the disease. The preclinical stages can take up to four years. This is when the, 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 the vaccine is being tested on animals preclinically. It can take up to four, to four years. And then there are the clinical stages uh, where the virus is tested on human beings. And uh, the clinical stages have got um, key uh, main three phases, one, two, and three, but there can be more because you can get 3A, you can get 2B, 2A and B, 3A and so on. So this can be more, but these are the key phases, phase one, two, and three. The main difference is what is being tested. The first thing that is tested will be safety of the, of the, of the virus on a small number of people. By the time it gets to the third stage, we are talking about testing on thousands and thousands of people. Uh, and this can take up to eight years. And then of course, there will be registration and then the launch. Launch is important because it involves uh, what you call um, uh, the factories and everything, the, the machinery that is going to produce in large, uh, what you call uh, uh, scaling up and so on. So, um, but you can get accelerated versions of this um, uh, process, which is what is happening now. The accelerated, uh, what called the, the preclinical stage can be reduced up to six months. 
And in this case, I think the preclinical stages has been at most just three months because most people by um, April had, had moved to the phase one, which is uh, they finished the virus was discovered in December around then. So people would have started working on, 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 on this um, in January, February. Um, <clears throat> but it's now just um, seven months and people say they're already at uh, 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 phase three of the clinical uh, stages. So the acceleration of this virus has been astounding, really, the process that's been taken. And I've been finding it quite strange that the Westerners are blaming the Russians for, um, for saying that they have already developed a, a virus, saying that they have not followed, but everybody has, has accelerated. In the West also, they have acceleration. Acceleration basically uh, means that you, you continue to the next phase before you even get the results from the previous phase. So you can you can start the preclinical the clinical stages even before you have completed the preclinical stages. That's how acceleration um, uh, occurs. So, but obviously there's a lot of jealousy between the the West and and, and Russia because there's nothing that Russia has done that is different from what the others are doing. So there are two vaccines that are currently in the advanced stages of, uh, of development. There is one that's produced in Russia by the Gamaleya Research Institute of Epidemiology. And this is the same institute that uh, produced the Ebola virus. So they are um, uh, very well resourced apparently and have got already all the structures. So they would reduce all of that uh, stage of registration and, uh, and launching because they already have the facility, is already set up. They, and, and the virus that they are using is the same strategy that's used by the Oxford one. It's using the, what called the vector. It's using an adenovirus vector, which is taken from a, a, a chimpanzee, and they've inserted the, 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 the gene from coronavirus in it. The Russians are using exactly the same strategy as, as the as Oxford people. But the Russians already have the layout of, a, of, of the situation because they've already done a similar vaccine in, in, in Ebola. So it's not surprising that they have um, a, a what called moved faster than others. Moderna is the one that's producing the mRNA virus. This is um, uh, what called, and the other thing is with the Russians, this is a, a publicly funded uh, 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 initiative. The Moderna initiative, because uh, I think it's another important part of this vaccine thing. The Moderna one call is, is mostly um, 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 uh, privately funded. I mean, if you look at the strategic uh, collaborators here, AstraZeneca, Merck, Vertex, Barda, Belinda, and, and Melinda Gates, and DARPA, this is more, these are the key strategic collaborators of the Moderna one, which is the one um, uh, that's uh, produced by the West, it's an mRNA virus. And they've got a strategic collaboration also with the USA government. Their uh, headquarters is, is at uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So the virus, um, uh, uh, what's called uh, uh, production, like I say, like I said here, for COVID-19, the vaccine development is comparable to landing on the moon. And that is where the jealousy is coming between the West and Russia, because it's almost like going to, to the moon. And the Russians are quite aware of that because they've called theirs, uh, their vaccine uh, is called Sputnik to, uh, to underline the fact that it's a major, uh, what you call psychological um, a victory <laughs> over the West for them, I think, in terms of the achievement to get this virus, this vaccine so quickly. Um, and it's ready for production. The, 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 the Russians are ready for production. Um, the Moderna one, the, the, the update um, uh, indicates that by July 27, which is about two weeks ago, um, this um, uh, 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 is, is at phase three of study. The phase three started on the 27th of July. So it's also at the tail end, but it might take a bit longer for them because they would probably have to 
to the registration and the launching that the Russians uh, already have done. So those, those are the vaccines. Now, um, we talk about the vaccine production itself as being the key uh, thing about uh, the, the, the vaccination. But the major problem is going to come at uh, uh, what is called vaccine nationalism. And I think for political parties, it's important to, um, to look at the, what called to watch this vaccine nationalism and how it uh, impacts a society. Um, the, the, the one thing that you've already seen about the, the vaccine is it's a, a, a linkage to national prestige. Already you can see the competition between Russians and the West. But it's also about national security. Um, um, the Russians, obviously, the first thing they've said they're going to do their vaccine is geared towards protecting their people. That is, the, that is their main priority. Um, the West um, is uh, um, having a problem. Yeah, like you see this article that comes from science. Science, of course, is um, together with nature, the um, um, science publications uh, in the world. And uh, this article uh, appeared um, in July 28, talking about vaccine uh, uh, nationalism, which uh, threatens global plan to distribute COVID-19. You probably already know that uh, the, 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 the British have already um, pre-ordered uh, vaccines, vaccine dosages, billions of it, from all the country, uh, 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 companies that are developing uh, vaccines and promising and showing promising results. America, as you have seen in the earlier slide, is already uh, what call with Moderna. So <clears throat> it's clear that um, when the vaccine becomes available and if it works, it's going to be available um, and competition for it is going to be uh, 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 important and people are going to treat it for their national interest. So vaccine nationalism is the thing that comes with this vaccine production. Okay, so now let's look at the politics of the pandemic. And we start by looking at the global politics and the local politics. And then um, there's one part that at the end I'd like to talk about, uh, the failure of the liberation movement um, in this pandemic. One thing that has been baffling everybody and there is no um, a real uh, uh, answer to it is why the pandemic is not affecting Africans as it was expected. This, uh, 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 this article, as you can see, uh, was published again in Science uh, last week, um, trying to, 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 to ponder, there's nobody who really knows why is this pandemic not affecting the Africans as everybody has expected. Um, and as you can see in this article, there are many um, um, reasons that people are offering um, it says, it says the, 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 although community transmission was reported in major African uh, cities months ago, the predicted number of cities and deaths had not yet been observed. And this is something that we know very well here in, in Johannesburg, because even before the lockdown, um, um, uh, infections were reported at Alexander here in Johannesburg. And, uh, and in Kailich. And, um, and the obvious fear was that within uh, weeks, we were going to see bodies falling off the street in Alexander or Kailich because um, how were they going to uh, 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 prevent uh, community transmission? Because you know whoever got there probably got uh, in touch with some tourists or, got, or someone who got in touch with the tourists. But now they were introducing the community. There was going to be community transfer. But we all know that we haven't had uh, this kind of disaster happening in, 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 in Alexander or in Kyanich. So people have not been able to explain what is going on really in Africa. 
and other offers were that the young, the population in Africa is too young, median age is 19.7 years compared to the um, United States at 38.6. That's the median age. So Africans are younger, they think. Other people say that it's because of genetics and all sorts of things. But the bottom line is that people do not know why the virus is not having the kind of impact it has in Africa as it has in other countries. Now, the other things about the virus that um, uh, remain unresolved, um, the conspiracy theories between the Chinese and the USA, the, 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 the United States claims that the, China, the virus was created by China and China uh, claims that the virus was created by the United States and China uh, uh, can produce both a motivation, motive, as well as the capacity for the United States to, to produce the, the, the virus. We will never know the, 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 the truth, uh, uh, most probably, but um, it is a, a, a obviously something that both nations know. Uh, that there is technology to, to do anything these days. This paper that you see here, which was published in 2002, also in science, shows that um, by 2002, we already have <coughs> the technology, especially engineering technology. I'm talking about physical engineering, electrical engineering, and that kind of engineering, not biological engineering was already available to produce a virus de novo without using a template. Uh, you know, usually a, a big, uh, um, what called genetic material like that of a virus like this, would you would need a naturally occurring template to, to replicate it and produce another one. But by 2002, we actually have machines which can control, we can create a virus de novo completely without using any natural template and you just synthesize it in the laboratory, just like that. So the possibilities for creating a biological weapons are quite advanced now and both countries know that. So, but obviously we are just a political tool. It's a conspiracy theories between the two of them. We do not know what the truths are because they are people that are um, uh, have got a serious problem. The key observation about the pandemic is that it is happening in the middle of a vicious economic warfare between the two nations, USA and China. And I think that is important because in spite of what everybody thinks or everybody says that the major threat posed by this virus actually is not human health. But that is what everybody is saying. And everybody is expressing fears about the virus as a major threat against human health. Actually, if you look at it closely, you find that this virus has got a small debt on human health compared to what it's doing to economies. It's destroying its economies and it's forcing the world to realign. And therefore, this pandemic its aftermath is not going to be health problem, it's going to be major shifts in geopolitics. Um, you look at this um, uh, uh, report here, this is something um, uh, uh, in the United States, reporting thousands and thousands of people queuing in cars in Dallas, which is in Texas. I believe Texas is the one of the richest, wealthiest states in America. These are people queuing for noodles and you know, basic things. When you look at the queues of those cars, these are top range cars. These are people driving in top range cars to queue for basic food like rice uh, in Texas. Um, so the, pan the, the pandemic has exposed a lot of things. Um, in the world. It has uh, 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 exposed the fallacy of the notion of uh, democracy in America because it displayed very clearly the 
structural exclusion of Black Americans from the economy of, uh, of the United States of America. And, and, and that was done so well by this virus. And it, it's undeniable, even them, uh, they cannot deny. They are pretending to be uh, what called finding or committed to finding solutions to it. We all know it's not going to happen, um, but it's causing also Black Americans to really, really be convinced that they are excluded from that, then they need to do something. So they are talking about the reparations, specific uh, what called uh, land restitution. Uh, they even think some of them of their own state as Black people because they believe they can develop that way. They also now realize that they cannot survive politically by supporting the, 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 the Democratic Party, which is what they've been doing over the years. They realize that the Democrats and the, and the, and the, and the, um, and the Republicans are essentially the same. So the solution for Black Americans seem to be to form their own party. Uh, basically, there are 41 million of them. They should be able to make a significant political force in America. So it is changing because that has been exposed completely. Also, the fragilities that were hidden of the so-called first world nations were exposed. Americans were not even able to support to 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 to, uh, to afford um, um, masks, let alone the ventilators. Uh, in the beginning, they were fumbling all over the place and even thinking of motor companies to start developing their own uh, 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 ventilators. And China came to help them in the end. So that sort of uh, uh, fragility was hidden before. But now we know that actually the American health system is extremely vulnerable. Also, the looseness of uh, alliances, what people thought were strong alliances actually have been exposed to be quite loose. You look at the European Union. In the end, they had to, um, to apologize for letting uh, uh, Italy deal with their problem alone and cause so much damage. Even though they are in a union, you would expect that the European Union had go ahead an arrangement, a structural arrangement to deal with things like uh, with national disasters as a union. But no, they watched Italy die. And only towards the end, or uh, towards the height of the what called of the Italian, um, then they, they had to apologize. France and Germany and others had to directly apologize to Italy. So that's the so-called uh, alliances that were there, they are looseness. So obviously the way they are going to do things in the future is going to be different exactly as a, as a result of this. So there are going to be major um, 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 shifts in geopolitics caused by this virus. Now, I'm saying that this virus is actually a small dent. There is only 3.6% of people worldwide who have died out of this virus. As you can see here in this slide, this was um, uh, um, yeah, two days ago, on the 13th of August, 20 million people um, are infected, and um, just about a quarter, uh, the three quarters of a million uh, actually died uh, so far. So the, 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 the actual hurt to humankind here is not to their health. It's the economies that have been shattered, really. So, but of course, the people who control everything, who control our minds, who control everything, they give the impression that what they fear is us dying. No, what they fear is the major disruption that is happening to the world. This is only 1% of the population, of the world population that is being attacked by this virus, really. Because 99% of the people do not have the kind of, uh, of interests that these people have. They control the shift are going to happen and the turmoil is going to be in that 1% of the world population. That's where the most of the damage is happening. Of course, capitalists will never say that we are worried about the loss of our profits. They're going to say we are worried about the loss of jobs. 
we are worried about poverty. They don't care about poverty. When this thing is over and everybody is grappling to recover from it, the first casualties is going to be labor. The same people are saying they're worried about jobs. It's always the labor that will be the best, the first casualty. We look at this again, it's published in, the, in, in two days, uh, on the 7th of August in, uh, in, in Science, showing the, the, um, the, the, the damage that's been caused by the, the, by the virus. The infections, um, if you look at the world, the majority of the people is the Americans and the Europeans, less so in Asia and in Africa. Almost nothing happening in Africa. And people might say in Africa is because testing has not been done. This is not published by Africans, it's published by them. It shows that, in fact, Africans have been testing in a comparative way amongst themselves. You know, uh, uh, um, throughout, it's not about testing. And in any case, the, the virus is not about the, the, the infected, infected people, it's about dead people. So no one uh, can hide dead people unless the totalitarian and ruthless uh, nation that can do this. And there are, there are fewer that have got that ability in the world. You can't hide dead people uh, easily, even as a, as, a, as, a, as a government. If you look at the amount, at, at the deaths, this is the death uh, uh, trajectories in the, in the rest of the world. You can see how America and Europe how it has affected them. So the majority of these problems is going into to be in the in in, in, in those countries. And, and unfortunately, these are the countries which have a footprint throughout the world. Shifts in geopolitics that happen in those areas is going to affect everyone else in the world. Um, And we now look also at the same time at the situation in America. America at the moment is in debt up to the tune of 26 trillion. And these are the people who are printing paper money recently, 3 trillion to boost business. And, and we know that the business that they're boosting is the top one, is not the bottom one. Um, and you can see that the the historical debt of America now, the gray one, if you look here, is higher than what it was during the First World War, by far, and is projected to increase. We all know what that means. If America goes broke, America has got a huge military footprint throughout the world. It's already have debt, but it pretends like it does not have debt, is giving aid to everybody, dropping uh, food parcels from the sky into African soil, uh, but they have, uh, they have a debt, debt, debt. Why are they managing to do this? Because of their um, um, uh, um, superior military power. Now, <clears throat> the industries that have been affected a lot by this, um, uh, the report that comes from them, obviously, is uh, the airlines, gaming, leisure, you know, tourism, the automobile uh, uh, industry, as well as oil. We know also that oil in America was at some stage dropped to below uh, a, a cent at some stage. I don't know what was happening at the time. There was something in the Middle East. So. <clears throat> These are very important industries that have been affected. They are going to shift a lot of uh, social uh, 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 order. Um, can move fast on that. So the data that I've been showing you now, the information that I'm showing you now, shows that um, what is going to be to happen as a result of the pandemic. Besides the threat that is perceived against human um, uh, health is actually social order. That is the, where the dent is going to happen. USA is a well-armed bully. And at the same time, it has lost credibility as a world leader 
who people will believe that it was a reliable world leader. Fewer people, even their allies in Europe, are starting to doubt that USA can be um, uh, trusted. <clears throat> and this pandemic actually reinforced that status. The shambles of the way in which the, the, the shambolic way that they are uh, uh, managing it, America, shows people that they really can't rely on the intelligence of the United States anymore. The shift in uh, alliances is already occurring. We can see what happened uh, uh, as soon as the pandemic started and everything. Iran had the confidence to send uh, oil to Venezuela. Both countries are under sanctions by America, but they already showed that they will use that time to maneuver. Cuba also started uh, showing uh, uh, humanitarian activity in Italy and South Africa and the United States was very unhappy. This is a small example, which shows that there are different maneuverings that are going to happen, which are going to change. And this is going to be worse when it comes to economics, because in the, in, in the business world, um, um, people are not driven by um, uh, scruples or morals, they are driven by, by, uh, by, by, by profits. If um, uh, opportunities appear, they're going to set aside all moral values and change the alliances. So those things are going to happen as a uh, social order is being uh, um, uh, disrupted by the pandemic. Um, governments have already started taking advantage uh, to introduce new regulations, um, uh, taking advantage of the, of the, of, of the pandemic. Uh, it's happening in Europe. It's already uh, what call causing some troubles in, 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 um, in the United States. The electoral process is uh, being modified there and there is um, uh, a worries. Also, again, that is also exposing the fragility of American democracy because they even think that it's possible that Trump might refuse to, to leave power. Now, I wouldn't think America would have to acquiesce like that. They obviously do not trust the, the what call the integrity of the electoral process, which they think they've always presented as if it was, uh, uh, you know, um, free of, uh, of, of, of uh, the kind of problems that other people have in, the, in what they call the, the third world. But they now have got a problem showing that they do not trust one another themselves. So the electoral processes are being modified, not just in America, but in other parts of the world. Um, and there's going to be increased exploitation uh, of people because as people recover from this thing, as the companies recover from this thing, the first thing they're going to do is to exploit people even further. Um, and the exploitation of people is going to cause instability because people are not going to be happy being exploited. Now, <clears throat> in South Africa, we have a problem, I think, because um, we have a problem basically of poor leadership. There is a proliferation of counter-revolutionary politicians who have taken the, 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 the political podia. The opposition to the ruling party is inappropriate. And on top of that, we are cursed with an inept uh, news uh, and media. Um, however, I think during this pandemic, we have benefited from excellent and conscientious and very committed healthcare workers. Most people will tell you how our hospitals, especially in rural areas, have worked under very, very difficult conditions with no facilities whatsoever, but they've managed to save lives nevertheless. People have been talking on radio, talking about what these people did for them with nothing in the rural areas. But the other thing that is clear is that survival of people in this pandemic was directly uh, what's called related to um, 
the healthcare facilities available uh, in, 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 in that part of the world. If you look around the country, in fact, around the world, and in America, it was, it was clear, uh, 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 abundantly clear, that um, it's, it's, even though there is no treatment, but the quality of healthcare was what really helped to save people. Now, in our country, in rural areas, there's absolutely no care for people. It was not there, and the pandemic just exposed it so clearly. But our problem, I think, is this problem of cynical politicians. I mean, if you look at this picture, this is supposed to solve transport problems in the rural areas where there are no roads at all. Let's know, we're not just talking about gravel roads. We are talking about no roads in many places. And they say they're going to solve that problem by using what you call. So they, 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 for me, it's, it's the fact that they're able to do this openly that is problematic because it shows cynicism of the top notch, really. And, and these are people who are counter-revolutionary because what they're doing really is to manage the downfall of the nation. And this is, it, 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 I find it really, really unbelievable that in South Africa, this thing is allowed. This thing here was, uh, was really condemned by the public on Twitter. Very, very few political organizations had a, had a memorable contribution to the condemnation of this thing that happened uh, in front of our eyes. The, the country is allowed to continue normally in, as, as, as a country of two worlds. This is the cynicism that you see here. There are two worlds displayed in this picture because these vehicles on the other side of, the, of this uh, parking lot are those that are designed to operate within the city on tarred roads. And these ones on this side are those that are going to be given to people in rural areas where there are no roads or where there are gravel roads. Um, and it's displayed here with pride. So we live in a country where there is formalized and normalized inequality and it should be the last straw, but no, it's not. It's not the last straw. People are actually riding that wave and we are accepting it. It's formalized and normalized inequality and people have no shame to show it. For me, this really shows that black people need a liberator, a true liberator, because there is no liberation, and, and people have abandoned the liberation movement, and we, we, we go on as if we are liberated people. We are not. This, to me, displays so abundantly clear that Black people are still under the yoke of oppression that where they were in during apartheid time. And without a liberation movement, parliamentary politics is not going to, to, to help this. This is a situation in the country at the moment. This is a, this is a number, this is a raw numbers of people who have died. And it's interesting that Eastern Cape has got this, and what called a trajectory of why in the Eastern Cape there are so many people dying. You compare the Eastern Cape uh, with the uh, Houting province. Now Houting has got double the, 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 the number of people in, in, in the Western Cape. Um, and it's been, uh, it's only started rising. The numbers started, in, in, these are raw numbers, by the way. They don't mean any as much. They just mean more people are dying. On the 18th of July, this is when uh, what go, uh, the, 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 the graph started to go steeply. Um, in other parts of the country, so the, the regions that are really affected by, the, uh, by this pandemic, um, um, the what you call Cape Town, Kauteng, Eastern Cape, and Guazmanatan. Um, the other regions are not 
um, so affected thus far. For some reason, the 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 start of uh, what call uh, the infection rates have been rising differently in different parts of the of the, of the country. Um, I do not know. I think that is probably related to the fact that the testing was done by identifying hotspots. So maybe in those places uh, where the the the, 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 the the death rates are emerging now, or the, I mean, the, the number of positive uh, cases are emerging are those that were done late. So now we're looking at death rate, not at raw numbers now, in the death rate. The death rate globally in, in the parts that were mostly affected, like Italy, you know, Germany, UK, America, Brazil, all those places, the death rate has been five to six percent. The national death rate in, 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 in South Africa started at two point, when I started collecting the data, it was 2.1 percent um, and, and went down to about 1.3 percent in the end. So the death rate in South Africa has been what is expected of this virus. It was right at the beginning, the death rate was um, I was, was worked up to between 1.7 and 3, um, and 3 percent. What's interesting is that in the country, Cape Town has got the highest death rate. And um, I've been asking many people why, what is so, because this death rate is, is directly connected with the facility, the, the healthcare delivery in those areas. Cape Town is supposed to have very, very good, uh, what called healthcare infrastructure. But people in Cape Town are dying double the time that they are dying elsewhere in the country. The gray, uh, what called, is, is, is Gauteng. Gauteng has been having a death rate of 0.7% for the majority of the time, 07 It's only around the 20, uh, what, to, after the 21st of July, that Houghton started getting to 1%, which is now it's about 1.4% or so. Um, so even though they're they are great numbers, Houghton has got the highest number of infections and it's got the highest number of uh, positive people, but it's got the smallest, comparatively speaking, number of people who have died from it. It's got twice as less as, as, as what call as, as, as Cape Town. What is happening in Cape Town? I do not know. In the Eastern Cape, it's clear what is happening. Eastern Cape is a neglected province. Nobody cares what's happening in the Eastern Cape. Besides the corruption that is that is adding to that, it has always been a neglected province. Um, and, and that is being exposed now. It shows very, very clearly. And what is interesting is to look at these trends and compare them with the decisions that have been taken uh, by, 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 by the government. Um, this is now the provincial death rate I showed you earlier. This is the national death rate. This shows that I started collecting this data on the 13th of June. By the 11th of June, the trend, the death rate was really uh, going down at the time, which means the number of infected people was increasing, but the number of dying people was, 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 was low. Um, and then, of course, this was uh, around the 14, 15 there. That was where the second alcohol ban uh, happened. Um, and it shows there that there was an, 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 an increase in the death rate. But this, is, this increase is not a, 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 an accurate one because it's showing basically that the infection rate was going down, the number of positive uh, people was uh, was lower because when I look at the raw figures, the number of dying people basically stays the same. But because the number of people, what call it, looks like the death rate is going up, but it's really not changing. The first alcohol uh, ban, um, the, 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 when they first allowed alcohol was on the 30th of May. Um, 31st of May, which was before, two weeks before this data here is, is that I'm showing. And it shows that uh, uh, what's called 
the infection rate basically was was uh, 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 was what increasing at uh, at the time. So people talk about the the alcohol home use. The alcohol uh, 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 um, the, the release of alcohol in level three. I don't think would have caused an increase in infections. But what it of course would be a burden on the hospitals. And I think the government also says that, the burden on the hospitals, because the hospitals arrangements were very, very weak. And, and if you look at uh, Eastern Cape, it was two weeks after the ban of, of alcohol, but a really sharp rise of dying people occurred on the 21st. And this was the time when Zueli uh, really also uh, he went to the Eastern Cape on the 22nd, I think. Um, uh, and, and obviously they had seen something. There was a burden in the hospitals because those hospitals, especially those in PE, were very, very, most of the deaths I think in Eastern Cape were occurred in PE. You can imagine in PE. That's where most of the problems were. were, were, were. Um, but you must also remember that at the time of, uh, of the alcohol ban, also 8 million people returned to work during that time. The return of people to work is what would have increased, uh, what to call not the alcohol ban, but the return of 8 million people to work would have increased uh, what call infections. But we didn't see much of that really uh, 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 occurring, the infection rate happened because we see that infection rate actually is increasing. This graph here showing the national death rate, really what is showing the spike in the what call that increase in the death rate uh, that curve there is really because the number of people who have been infected, I mean, positive people has decreased. And if you look at the overall infection rate, the number of people of positive people to the number of people that were tested. Um, since I started on the 13th of January, rose and it seems to me that it's now coming to a plateau. Um, with so-called uh, flat, uh, flattening. So we are reaching, we reached it uh, at least by now. So I think it was reasonable for me. Now I saw Nusa is, uh, uh, is querying some of the data. I do not think that the data collected in South Africa are unreliable. I don't think so at all. Um, there is no way you can get a completely accurate record because I know for a fact that there are people who dealt with COVID without testing and got uh, what called um, uh, 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 healthy. They dealt with it, they didn't go for testing and they treated it and they became, they recovered from it. So there are many people who were never tested, but who got it and then became healthy and did not die. But there are also people who are asymptomatic um, who just get something like a mild flu and then they carry on. Others don't even get the mild flu. So there are many people who were infected. So we cannot, it's not possible to record everybody that got infected by the virus. We can only record everybody that recognized infections and then went for testing. Um, but in terms of the infection rate in South Africa, it's what is expected. 1.7 to about 3%, that is infection rate. Uh, but we see here in, <clears throat> in, 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 in South Africa, uh, I mean, the death rate is it, it, it's 1.7 to 1.3, which is what was expected of this virus because of its nature. It's similar to the other coronavirus. Um, so I do not think that there's been manipulation of the data, but the manipulation of the data is queried because what was expected by scientists has not happened. I think that is the main problem. So I thought I should um, end by talking by, uh, about this because it bothers me a lot. That um, the political 
situation in South Africa is really, really troubling because the dominant force is that from counter-revolutionary politicians. And I'm saying counter-revolutionary politicians because these are people who are working in complete diametrically opposite, uh, opposite to what the liberation was about. The role of imperialists in South Africa is astounding. It's astounding and, uh, and, and it's happening in front of our eyes. We are seeing the, the, the what called the Bretton Woods organizations, IMF, and uh, the World Bank putting their claws completely, they are embedding them in the political situation. It's happening in front of us. And that's what we expect because that's what they do. They always exploit situations of crisis like this one, those organizations. That is their way, the way of, uh, that's how they do things. And we know that those organizations never assist of economies. They take over economies. But it's happening here. So we have a problem where imperialists are entrenching themselves and capturing the state. And then, of course, the ruling party has got this internal treachery by unscrupulous and immoral politicians. Um, it, 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 it's, it's astounding what's happening in, within the ANC, where people are able to steal money that is supposed to rescue a nation and steal it just like that. Um, so that is immoral to me. It's not only unscrupulous, it's completely immoral. People are dying and there's a money for rescue and you steal it, even food parcels. You steal even food parcels as a, as a ward councillor or whatever. This is immoral. So we, we, we've got a serious problem. And then there is a problem of um, um, inappropriate opposition, which I'm going to give in the last slide that comes after that. It, it's a particular uh, um, uh, uh, treatment because I, I, I worry also about it. Then the news media. This is very important because the media that we have is basically the media, the sort of media that facilitates self-serving government propaganda. You know, the media has been, um, uh, I don't know whether it's been asked by the, the government to do that, but throughout this, the news that they're giving is news that is clearly designed to scare people rather than to give them proper information. You know, there was a time when there was, the news was uh, about two weeks ago, they screamed that the South Africans recorded the highest number of, uh, of a positive, <clears throat> a what called COVID deaths. It was around the time when they were digging um, a million graves or something like that. <clears throat> and the media, the radios were announcing that the highest number, 14,000 people, um, uh, have now been recorded in, in, in South Africa to have uh, what you call in one in, 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 in 24 hours. But they did not mention that in that, 20, in that particular day, the government had uh, done 10,000 more tests than usual. So it's not, the, the, and also the news that people are also they're looking at the raw figures. It's not the number of positive people, it's the rate the number of uh, uh, positive people to the number of tested people that we should be getting so that we can see. It's clear now when you look at the figures, even though the figures, the number of people are being tested is much, much lower. These days, this past week, it's been much, much lower, but the rate of infections is lower as well. The number of positive people to those people who have been tested has been going to about 27, 26%. It's now about 16%. So it's not the numbers that are reported that is important, it's the rate that, that we should be looking at. 
So we have got a media that uses these numbers in order to facilitate what the government is going to do. Because by giving the impression that people are going to die in millions, you are also motivating for a tender of a million gay graves as well. We should have a media just that's not that is vigilant, that is that is that carries that immediately and tells people, you see what I mean? But they are not doing that. The media is embedded. All these treacherous activities happening in these political organizations are facilitated by these media people who are embedded in the political parties. And they are facilitating propaganda and all kinds of activities by this. So we, we how can as a nation we survive? And, 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 and get to freedom if we've got these kinds of arrangements where, where our people can't even have proper information through a news media. And we can't because we have no control. The media is not African media, it's Eurocentric media. It does not have the agenda of Africans. It's got other agendas. So these are things that I think we should be looking at. Now, in terms of opposition, there is no opposition to the government really as far as I'm concerned, because we cannot call the DA uh, opposition, really. And we cannot call EFF opposition because it's just another version of the ANC. Um, so we have got a problem. When we do not have an opposition, we have a problem because then we do not ask the correct question. There is intellectual dearth. The correct questions are not asked. And if you don't ask the correct questions, we can never sort out the problems. Take, for example, the situation of Marikana. Marikana was a demonstration of a dangerous partnership between the state and capital. That was the core problem. It was a phenomenon where the state and capital are in, in intimate partnership. Now in South Africa, that kind of partnership must be a dodgy partnership because the state and capital in South Africa at the moment should have divergent interests. The state here has got the responsibility of liberating people. The capital has got the responsibility of making um, a, a, a profit. The state does not have control of the capital. So they can, they, they, if they agree, then it means there's something wrong. It means there's something wrong because we have not taken over the economy. People who control the economy do not have the same interest as the state. So if there is a partnership there, then there is a problem. But what did the South Africans do? They are focusing as we always do, we're always focusing on the isolated thing. We focused on Ramaphosa. It does not matter. Ramaphosa does not matter because he's just an isolated tool within this big arrangement. The key problem is the intimate partnership between the state and capital. And you can remove Ramaphosa, there will be another person and that relationship will stay. So what we should be doing is to say, how do we solve this problem of the state and capital? Two sectors or, or, or forces which have got divergent interests. How can they be in intimate partnership? But that what happened there showed that there is that kind of intimate partnership that in 10 minutes, they were able to kill 34 million South Africans. And South Africans after that, just we looked and we focused on Ramaphosa as usual, which is another something that organizers said, if there was real liberation movement in opposition, we should have actually, stop the government from this thing of commissions. If you remember this phenomenon of commissions, which I think is peculiar to South Africans only, is something that apartheid was doing. Each time they wanted to hide information, they would put an, a, what called a, a commission. So the same thing happened with Manikana. The commission takes a long time 
people are allowed to vent whatever, and in the end, there's an executive summary and a ceremony to give a report to the, to the president, the same president in this case who was the problem. So we, 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 we have that problem because we don't ask the correct questions. Same thing is happening with distortion of the land question. Every problem that we have as a people, I'm talking about black people, if the, the problem that we have there can be traced, every problem, including the turmoil in our social organization, the turmoil within the family unit, is caused by the absence of land, by the fact that we don't have control of land. But we are allowing the ANC and other people to reduce land to something to be tilled, something to cultivate. No, no, land is not about life. Land is about identity. It's where we have the ability for self-determination as a people and to do things and organize ourselves the way that suits us according to our culture. But we do not have that. So everything that we have that is a problem can be traced back to land. So this thing of how the land is being distorted, what the land question is being distorted, is because there is no intellectual voice that's really doing that. And these parties, this opposition that is there, cannot do this. They cannot, because they never understood the land question in the first place. So I'm saying that this is a problem that I wish could be corrected. A proper opposition to this ruling party, because without that, I think we are doomed as a people. The last thing I want to talk about is the fact that we are a defeated people, black people all over the world. And we, we, we are defeated people psychologically. And this, you can see it very, and most of it has been achieved by the oppressors through gaslighting. If you notice, if there is a problem, someone is complaining about racism, and you complain that there is racism, you find Black people being the first ones to protect the racists by saying that Black people can be racist as well. How can we be racist as a Black people? Anywhere in the world, there is not one inch on the planet where Black people are truly, truly free, where they do not have to defend their humanity. How can you then say that we can dish out racism? But black people are the first ones to do that, to protect uh, what's called a, 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 a racist. And this is happening because of gaslighting. And the gaslighting has been happening at a grander state scale, where we have actually, as Africans, started to exonerate the oppressors, the imperialists by saying, by agreeing with them. They are the ones who tell us about African dictators. They say that Africa is like this because of the dictators. Yes, they may be weak leaders, those. But we must remember that when these people, the West says that they are dictators, they just want money, they just want wealth, as if all they did was to offer them money in order to cause the havoc they are causing in, 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 in Africa. No, that's not. They first bring the guns and they say, if you don't do it, then we, we, if you don't take the money, then you, 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 you get the gun. And they have done that with others. We know what happened to Kwame Nkrumah and many other African leaders who would not go that direction. So, but what we do also as Africans, we have also fallen into the trap of blaming the ills of Africa on African dictators, thereby exonerating the, the what call the, the oppressors. And yet the oppressor, the imperialists, the colonizers have not left Africa, but we are exonerating them by focusing on dictators. I'm not saying that we should not talk about the dictators and condemn them, but we should not in doing so exonerate the people because they are still here. They are still causing problems. They are sitting behind. What we see in South Africa, gaslighting also is happening. We're looking at the black people who are destroying state uh, uh, enterprises, ESCOM and all these things. 
and, 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 and white people say that this is black corruption. But if you look closely in all these situations, there are white people at the core of it. But we have ourselves now started to say that the problem is that black people are just poor and we're exonerating. I mean, white people still sitting on our necks on this, in this country. But we do not see that. We do not see that because they have actually gaslit it for years and years and years. And I think in order to come out of that, we need really, really brave people who will be able to get out of the norms and be able to say it and call a spade a spade and get us free again because mentally or psychologically we are a defeated people. We are not going to win the struggle if we stay like that. Without brave, brave leaders, we're just not going to manage it. Thank you. I'm sorry if I took too long, guys. That <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Uh, what an impressive, uh, inspiring, educational and um, informative and empowering presentation. Thanks, uh, uh, Comrade uh, Monde. Um, I just want to say to everybody that if you have any further questions or issues that you want to raise, uh, you are more than welcome to engage with uh, uh, Comrade Monde on Twitter at uh, Monde and Twasa. That's, that's his um, Twitter handle. So that if uh, some of your questions have not been answered through uh, you know, this presentation, um, you may engage with him uh, there. But it was quite um, eye-opening and a lot has been shared uh, this afternoon. And I don't think that we will have you know, the time to engage with all of the issues that have been presented uh, today. And a lot has been clarified. So uh, thanks for the inspiring uh, presentation, Tawa. Um, just in terms of a few questions that I may pose to you, you know, some of the conspiracy issues um, that tend to come up. The first one is the 5G thing. Um, is there any, any relation uh, to you know, 5G, the development of the virus to the 5G technology? Uh, because I've you know, seen and heard a lot of people ascribing you know, the development of the virus to you know, the economic warfare about 5G between uh, China and, and the USA. Your comment on that? Um, you know, the, the one called the, 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 the things that were circulated at the beginning of this pandemic about 5G where we're trying to link the 5G to say that there's no virus, there's 5G. That one I want to, 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 to completely, you know, reject completely. It's just not true. The virus is there, there's no doubt about it. And we cannot say the disease, the coronavirus, the, the, the COVID-19 is caused by 5G. So, because that's what some of those uh, uh, what called uh, uh, things were saying um, that were circulated. But the economic warfare, you know, between China and the, and the US is real. And, um, you know, pandemics have always been happening during the time of warfare, or, at, at, at the, you know, have, have been going parallel with warfare the past. Uh, con, uh, con, if you remember the one 1918 was during the first world war and one before that was another um, European war so but this time is no physical war military war but it's happening at the height of a, an economic warfare between the USA and what called that one is real and um, and and 5g is very powerful um, in terms of penetrating um, uh, the, the cyberspace of other countries. Um, so um, that and, and and China has already taken that space and is is is, is, is proliferating, it's expanding it around the world, and that one is real, you know. But if to connect it to COVID, I don't think so. But COVID definitely is um, uh, 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 is is exacerbated. It's in fact exacerbated by the economic warfare between 
the US and China. But I would be direct uh, with Colin that this is I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Just in terms of, um, you, know, you know, the receptors of the different uh, species of uh, people that we have, is it um, true that the manner in which uh, we receive the virus as, uh, you know, the dark skinned um, or the, the, this uh, darker hue uh, is different to, uh, you know, the other Europeans and, and Asian people? No, okay, so the genetic differences that were, were, were some people were speculating were based on uh, vitamin D. Mm. Um, and vitamin D is uh, supporting the innate immune system. Um, and it, it is known that um, uh, uh, black people have got a, 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 a not stronger than uh, white people in terms of um, manufacturing vitamin D because yes. of, uh, of, of food melanin. And therefore, they, this was speculation that they might have a, 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 a more susceptible. So mm. uh, people were saying that uh, black people are probably dying more in America because of, a, of, of, a, of, of, of a, a lesser vitamin D. I don't really agree with that because even though we 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 make uh, we, we may have less ability as uh, uh, because of our darker skin to make vitamin D, you get mm -hmm. vitamin D uh, through food stuff through other things as well, exactly. and you can buy it. So, I mean, so um, and 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 those people were saying that with those people really who were trying to remove the social aspect of the death of black people, the political aspect of it, and uh, saying that no, let's blame what called their genetics instead of blaming. Mm -hmm. The black people in America were dying because they're excluded from the economy. There was, there was racism that was also occurring where in some cases that it was on CNN where someone wanted to be tested because, and they were not tested because they mm -hmm. were black. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, so uh, people would use those things in order to, uh, to, to support uh, uh, the, the, the narratives. No, no, great. Um, you know, the, the other thing that, um, you know, some of us have been interested in is um, around the, the fact that we have not had, you know, different perspectives and different narratives to what is in the mainstream. Um, probably because we have been lacking the voice of the, what I call the patriotic scientists. Uh, why is it that we don't hear more of, you know, the different voice, uh, you know, that challenges the, the narrative that we seem to be hearing more about uh, what is happening with regards to this pandemic? Uh, and I think that's, that's the first point that I wanted to, to, to make. And the, and the second one relates to, um, you know, the, the, this pandemic being more prevalent than uh, hunger and poverty, which I think, you know, are uh, more of a pandemic for African people in terms of, uh, you know, the extent to which they destroy people's lives and they kill. I don't know what your perspective is to, to, to that. Okay, if I understand you well, you say, why are we paying more attention to this uh, pandemic when it actually is this is this the is this the real killer more than, than... <laughs> it's actually killing less people than many other things? <laughs> exactly, exactly, and yet it is it is so predominant, uh, you know. And, uh, but it has such a big impact. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a fair question to 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 ask. Why is it but there are people die? Um, uh, more people die of flu than they have died out of this pandemic. Exactly. So, and and and, uh, and you would think that in the country everybody who's died in the past seven months has died of COVID. Nobody's talking about all the other people who've been dying. Exactly. <laughs> that is my that is my issue because people have been dying. And, and what I've heard, I mean, from the beginning of this uh, pandemic, that you know other diseases are more killers than this coronavirus, and yet. Uh, we are, you know, occupied and preoccupied by it, and we close down the economy just so that we can respond to it. And even when we close down the economy, uh, you know, we didn't see much. Well, I think what you, what you should, I don't know if you realize what I was saying, 
when I was yeah. telling you about what that this pandemic is not about you or me. Mm. It's not about us, really. But it's presented by the powerful as if it is pandemic it is. unnatural mechanisms to rearrange the planet. Mm. That's why it has happened in all the pandemics. They have changed the planet. They are natural mechanisms by which the planet has been changed. This pandemic manages to do that because it's one of many coronaviruses, right? The, the flu virus and the coronavirus. Yeah. Um, this is one of them. But this one is different. It causes a disease that is not the same as the other mm. coronaviruses. Mm, you know, mm. in which we did not even know whether, whether it was respiratory. And it now turns out it's not completely respiratory, it's actually a circulatory, uh, what to call blood uh, disease. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and there is no cure for it. That was the problem. The main problem with the virus is that there was no cure. There and was people no cure. were dying in a very frightening way. When people were dying, you know, you can't breathe, you can't have people were dying yeah. in a frightening way. So it really frightened people. And then it uh, caused people to lock down. That uh, was the problem. Uh, uh, and uh, it was necessary to lock down because there is no cure. If yeah, there was yeah. a drug that could treat this, this virus, there would have been no need for a lockdown. For a lockdown. Mm. Yeah. So that, that is the difference between it and, and the other uh, conditions. So it's not that it's uh, really killing a lot more people, but it's scary in the sense that First of That's all, not true. it causes mm. a lot of people to become sick and need treatment in hospital, and yet the hospitals can't treat them. They can mm. only manage them. Mm. So basically, you take large and large numbers of people, you put them in a clinical setting, but you can't treat them. Yeah, you can yeah. only manage. You see what I mean? That is the problem with it. That is the main problem. But it's a perfect mechanism to mm. rearrange the world. Yeah. The world, the world, and the economy of the world. We do not keep exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, just just in terms of this coronavirus, I mean, there's been various um, you know strands and strains of of the coronavirus. There was something called um, I don't know, is MERS, uh, which existed before this uh, uh, SARS-CoV. Um, two, and there was another strand of the virus, and it's been. I think it's been with us for for a, a while. Why do you think it was um, not foreseen that it would be this devastating to, uh, you know, because I, I, my sense is that we saw it coming uh, for a while because, I mean, we have been dealing with the coronavirus for a while, different strains of the coronavirus. And this one from, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 seems to be more devastating than the other strains of the viruses that were there. And I'm not too sure whether the comments attributed to uh, you know the you know previous two presidents of the United States had anything to do with this particular pandemic because they did say uh, you know a couple of years back that you know the world needs to prepare for a pandemic uh, coming from some kind of a flu disease um, that is coming and that was some um, like 15 years ago. And even 10 years ago, we had the same, um, you know, comment coming out of, um, uh, you know, the, the previous president of the United States. Uh, I don't know what is your take on, on that? Well, I mean, the thing is, uh, pandemics have uh, happened periodically mm. since before Christ. I mean, the first pandemic that is known was about 460 years before Christ. <laughs> I think that it was a small post. Um, so um, all nations um, know that at some stage, a pandemic will come, and sometimes mm -hmm. global. And, and, and therefore, people need to, to prepare for them. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I, I think I think many people were asking the question uh, largely because of you know some of these conspiracies that okay if the Americans are saying uh, you know there is this pandemic uh, they are likely to be the you know the creators of the virus so that they can you know attack. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's quite possible that they they may well be. I mean, nobody really knows, but it's yeah. also not surprising if people plan for 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 for, for a pandemic. Because mm. it means that you, 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 you have to look at your healthcare situation. And this pandemic has shown that very well. 
that mm -hmm. uh, you can help. But the thing is, this time there were so many things that encouraged what people call conspiracy. I don't like the word <laughs> conspiracy theory because sometimes um, it, 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 it is used to stifle uh, criticism of things mm -hmm. by quickly calling people conspiracy theorists. <laughs> but, um, so, but, but, but there are many reasons why people would 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 um, expect because it is known that both China and America, it's been reported that they are working on biological weapons involving uh, viruses, mm, mm, and that they have got for this. And China is not uh, uh, denying that in Wuhan there is a facility where yeah. they, 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 are, they, they are doing this. So, but whether this virus has been created <clears throat> by them, it's not clear. It's not known. I know that there have been people at the beginning, uh, scientists, who said that there is no evidence uh, that this was an engineered uh, uh, virus. Of course, when you look at those articles, they're not uh, 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 supported by any experimental evidence that is uh, what called. They just say that we just did not see any trace of uh, 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 genetic engineering. But it would be quite hard to see, uh, if you look at that paper I was showing you, where you can create a virus, de novo. You can create that virus, that, that was a polio virus that was created de novo in the laboratory. It was, mm. it was not different from the other uh, uh, what called polio viruses. And there's yeah. no way you could have been able to say it was created de novo in a laboratory. So I don't know why these people are saying that they are sure that the virus that uh, it, it, it is not um, uh, engineered virus, this coronavirus. I do not know. Mm. There was, there's really no, but they just say that the, the, the scientists say that it's clear that this virus is not genetically engineered. Mm. So, mm. Yeah. Uh, it's quite interesting. I mean, if you if you look at uh, you know the stratification of our country, um, you know the spatial inequalities, uh, economic inequalities. Uh, you know that um, impact on the social well-being of our people. You would have expected more and more of our people to have been um, affected, you know, by this coronavirus and and perhaps dying uh, in greater numbers that, than what we are seeing now. Uh, could it be that uh, you know we, you know, black people are more resistant to to this virus because I mean some of the remedies that have been uh, you know spoken about you know, social distancing and, and all of those things are practically impossible in the majority of cases uh, where our people live. Um, you know, you can't expect uh, people in, in Kailicha to socially distance. It's, it's just impractical and impossible. And you can't expect, uh, you know, the majority of the people who are staying in the villages to, you know, wash their hands every day and do all of these things that are prescribed as uh, preventative by the government. Um, are there any other possible remedies that could have been considered besides, you know, this, um, you know, first aid um, uh, prescriptions that are given uh, by by the state? Well, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, and so I'd say the, one of the things that this virus did was to expose the inequalities. Mm, you did say it. mm. It's not only that. I mean, it, it, even. Um, it's not just social distancing, what call it, it's, it's other things. So look at the schools. Mm? Exactly. Mm. You know, we, we are allowing the whites are carried on with education as normal. Black people are not going to school. And it's, it's normal. In South Africa, it's normal. This it is, is normal, which is a problem for me. It's, horrible. it's normal that whites can continue having their education, but black people can stay at home. But you know, you're right. Uh, there is something that uh, uh, has been happening in the in the black community, which is not clear at the moment. You must remember, black people also have got indigenous knowledge mm. that they use towards people. And I think, really, in this case, that's what has worked. It's mm. normal for 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 Africans to yeah. eat mm. their face when there is a what call. And this would be a perfect way to prevent this, but even when it's actually infected you, to prevent it from spreading, to mm. steam your face and, mm. and, and, and inhale hot steam, because you, you kill it in the upper respiratory tract, and if it does exactly. not get past that, you know, you'll be fine. So I do not know. I mean, it, it, and the thing is also the lockdown. 
The lockdown in South Africa, all those measurements, like you say, they were for the urban areas. The exactly. lockdown never, was never... Actually, it was never a lockdown in any of the townships, it really. Did not, it was never observed in rural areas. It was not mm. observed in townships. Mm. So whatever has happened uh, to black people in South Africa cannot be attributed to the lockdown. No, it mm. can't be. Mm. The only thing that it can do is that it is not uh, uh, the lockdown that it did. Was it did not it prevented people from going to work. Work would be a perfect way of, uh, of, of distributing the disease. So we can, in fact, expect now that everybody, the, or the economy is completely open, that um, there may be, a, you know, a, a rise in infections. Uh, you do not use masks. Mm. Uh, uh, but, you know, because in, in the workplace, it's, it's almost impossible, really, to, to prevent. And it's going to be worse because you're going to be mixing people who probably, because black people probably have herd immunity by now, because yeah, yeah. they never locked down. And mm. herd immunity is very important because it's protective. It protects the community in which you are. So black mm. people in the townships and the rural areas would now be protecting themselves through herd immunity. So infection is, the virus will be weakened in those areas. Because mm. most people are now probably immune. They have had contact with the virus and the immune people protect the other ones. Exactly. Mm. Infection. But you know, people like us who've been sitting here in these bubbles now, <laughs> Once people who come, yeah, vulnerable. Have, have more vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> so there may be a shift of infections now. The people in the urban areas <laughs> are probably going to be in trouble now because we are going to mix. But at mm. the same time, it might help because the people who already have herd immunity will also protect those who have not been in lock, who have been in lockdown, who don't have that immunity. Mm. Because, um, you know, immunity does uh, block, you know. It's a mm. And I'm sure a lot of us are reminded of, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Chabalala Msimang with, uh, you know, her beetroot and uh, garlic remedies, because, you know, just about everyone is now talking garlic, beetroot, and, and all of those. As, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people uh, I just use their indigenous um, in it, um, uh, knowledge. And mm, 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 mm. Otherwise, we have the only God knows uh, what really is protecting Africa. <laughs> 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 Everybody has tried everything to try and explain. They just can't explain. I mean, when, when, I, when I saw uh, people getting infected in, in, in Kalita and what called before the lockdown and, 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 and Alexander, and I thought, mm. oh my God, we finished. Yeah. But yeah. what happened? Yeah. Well, um, great. And uh, I just want to, to thank you for really um, eye-opening and very inspiring presentation. And I really enjoyed it. And I'm hoping that all of uh, those uh, who managed to log in, um, really appreciated um, and uh, loved the presentation that you gave us this afternoon. And I'm sure uh, people are going to continue to interact with it. So you should expect, uh, you know, some DMs on your Twitter and coming <laughs> <laughs> asking, asking a couple of questions or two. Um, but I'm not why can't people speak here on this platform? <laughs> No, they can. I did allow them to speak, those who wanted to share their views, and people prefer to type their messages. Um, are, are you available on Facebook, uh, those who want to engage further? I'm not very strong on social, uh, not, not, social media. Not, I'm available mm -hmm. on Facebook, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm more you active on Twitter. But okay, more, more active on Twitter. Okay. So your Twitter handle is uh, at uh, Mondendwasa. Those who want to interact um, uh, with uh, Professor Mondendwasa, they are more than welcome to. It's been a very good um, uh, two hours, and I think uh, it's been well spent. And I want to thank you on behalf of uh, Azapo, uh, you know, for giving us the time to really engage uh, with us and share your perspective on uh, matters related to this uh, coronavirus. And uh, we would like to, to really thank you very much for- Oh, there are questions on this thing, eh? 
Yeah, there are questions, uh, but uh, if you look at yeah, but if you look at most of these questions that people were asking, you actually answered them through your presentation. Um, because as you are proceeding and I was noting all of these questions, I see, hmm, here's a question and here's the answer. So that's how good your presentation was. Um, the only thing that you may want to explain to some of the people is, you know, the issue around asymptomatic and the end and, and the meaning to it. Because I don't think you, you spoke about, uh, you know, those kinds yeah. of things. Yeah, well, that's very interesting, actually, because there was a paper that was put on Twitter yesterday by one of the mm -hmm. top journals. Uh, showing that um, there is a large number of asymptomatic people. Um, some of them are mild and some of them have no symptoms whatsoever. But what is encouraging is that those people who are asymptomatic produce very strong immunity. Mm. And it's shown, this one has been shown experimentally. They show in the journal that they have got very strong T cell, which is cell mediated immunity, as well as antibody immunity. So, um, and, and basically the paper is saying, the person who was tweeting it, uh, which was uh, a, a colleague of mine at Cambridge, is against this uh, lockdown. Yeah. Uh, he was showing that paper as proof that the lockdown was not necessary because <laughs> people will, uh, what called, probably have got uh, herd immunity. And herd immunity is uh, theoretically science to say that it will, um, uh, uh, be more effective when two thirds of the population of whatever population have been have got the immunity. Then you get a fully fledged herd immunity, mm. and people thought that it might take too long. Of course, with the numbers that we've got, we are far from two thirds. But you mm. see, there are many people who have had contact with the what call, and I can tell. I mean, the rural areas, probably virtually everybody, and in the townships, most people have had some brush with the with the COVID but a lot of them did not have any uh, uh, symptoms. So mm -hmm. it, it probably the virus is already weakening in terms of transmission um, uh, uh, because of the herd immunity. Yeah, asymptomatic people, yeah, it's experimentally shown that they do develop cell-mediated immunity in form of T cells <coughs> as well as antibody uh, immunity. And, and how do the flu, uh, flu, uh, what is it, flu stats compared to this uh, coronavirus deaths in terms of uh, the death rate? Do you have an idea? It's comparable. It's comparable. comparable. The death rate to flu, is because the death rate at the moment um, uh, is about 3%. Yeah, you did say. Um, mm. Yeah, so it's about, uh, it's, it's the same as flu, or even less, actually. And, or it's the same as for you, or even less, and yet we talk more about it. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's an interesting uh, aspect. I mean, the, the, only, the only thing with, it, with this coronavirus is that it's more transmissible compared to mm, mm, That is mm. another problem with it, that it, it, it's, it's much, much quicker to transmit. So one person can transmit it to three people in a very short time. In a very short space of time. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing I think uh, that is important, uh, which is this thing about this virus being airborne? Uh, because <laughs> is it really airborne? I think people uh, misinterpret the term airborne. Uh, what yeah. called, because I've seen people walking on the street alone in open spaces and putting masks on, and I'm yeah. thinking. They probably think that it's possible to get it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, you know, this, this thing. Someone was so like, "Airborne does not mean that." What airborne means is that in an uh, environment like in an, uh, a clinical setting in the in the lab in, in the mm, mm. hospitals where people are using machines to control patients, the what call the the ability of the of the virus to linger in the air is is is, 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 is there. much stronger. Also, mm. if you get into a situation like in a lift, even if you are alone, you don't know how many people were there before you. They have just left. So if the people have been with aerosol coming from their nostrils, from breathing, from talking, mm -hmm. um, they have gone, but the virus might still be lingering in the air and then you come in. So it's airborne like that. But yeah, um, yeah. it's not like it's, it's viruses cannot uh, uh, withstand desiccation, in other words, drying. They are mm. unlike bacteria. They, 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 they can't exist in a dry environment. So if you, you released it through spitting, 
yeah. um, when we're talking, mm. it's going to stay in that droplet. But once that droplet dries up, then the virus the dies. Up, yeah, the oh. virus will die. And it's unlike bacteria, because bacteria are different. They don't have that fetch thing uh, covering them. Therefore, they smell more. They're more like plants virus uh, bacteria. So they'll stay in a, in a dry environment. And they can even call, form spores. And the spores can be carried out in the air, you know, from the ground and creeped up by the air. So they, mm. can, they, they can be airborne that way. But this virus is not airborne in that way. So that if you're in an enclosed environment, yeah. Then you must know that it will linger in that situation for longer because of the environment where the wind is blowing nicely. Mm. And, it's not and, it's and, and to wear a mask when you're walking on the road. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and just you know, just inform me for how long does it linger? I mean, there's this thing that uh, you know, if for instance you are at your workstation and uh, you're working there and. Uh, Somebody else cannot come and sit on the same table and, and work with you because otherwise there's you know this uh, possibility that you may be infected by a virus you know through touching and 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 you know we we travel we travel through taxis through buses and and so forth and we touch we speak uh, and you're saying well this virus does linger for how long does it linger and um, okay so on surfaces. On purposes, it depends. So if you're sitting at a workstation where you're working on a computer, like I'm talking now, I mean, if I've got the virus now, it's probably on my cell phone, which is sitting here next to me. It's on yeah. the uh, on the on this thing. It's on this on the mouse. Um, so because I'm spraying as I'm speaking, I'm spraying mm. you know, mm. all droplets from my mouth. So, and they've done tests to show that on wood, it uh, stays uh, for that long, on paper for that long, cardboard for that long. So, it, it, you know, but it doesn't stay for, for too long. Mm. Like I say, once the surface dries, it's, in, it's almost impossible for the virus to survive in, in, a, mm. in a dry, uh, uh, what you call, space, because it's wet, basically. But, you know, the thing about taxes, um, what I found strange when they allowed 100% use in Texas was people saying that then open the windows. It just does not, did not make sense to me exactly. at all. Because exactly. when you are in a yeah. taxi and the taxi yeah. is moving, air comes from outside and goes. So if you are in front of the taxi and the windows are open and you cough, what you're in fact doing is to spray the virus throughout the taxi. You mm, put someone, mm. the, maybe the rare windows, the last windows, maybe those could be open because yeah. they basically would, 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 would suck the air out, you know, mm. from, from the mm. tank. But to open all the windows in the taxi is silly. And I mean, and this announcement, it seemed to be an advice from a white lady. And I'm thinking, has she ever even been in a taxi? Maybe yeah, she'll yeah. think about her family <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. In South Africa, that advice comes from people who don't have the experience <laughs> and, and the knowledge. You see, that's a problem. But they are trusted naturally because it's them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the other example is, is uh, relating to, you know, if sport, um, there was a time when, you know, when we were locked down and we really felt it and, you know, we wanted to just be in the, in the outside environment. And uh, when the gates were open, that people can jog and, and do all, all, all those kind of things. And there was, you know, floodgates opened. And we saw a lot of people on the road, uh, you know, running and, uh, you know, just enjoying the atmosphere. And, and I don't know, I, I read in some scientific journal that, um, especially if you are running um, as, as a group of people, so you need to give each other some kind of a distance of about two meters between yourself and the uh, you know guy in front of you, because otherwise all of those droplets are dropping back to you, and you don't know the guy in front of you whether he doesn't uh, or he's not a carrier of this virus, and you may just be, you know, grabbing it from all of those people who are running in front of you. Um, is that is that factual? Yeah, no, you're joking. Yeah, definitely. If you're joking without a mask and you're behind someone. If the person in front of you has got a COVID, you are putting yourself at risk. Mm. Um, so even outside, you you have to wear a mask when you are with other people, because yeah. the wind is going in all directions when you are walking. 
side by mm. side with someone. Mm. And it, it will be carried by the wind in that case. So it's airborne in that sense that it will move from the person next to you. Um, so, but again, if you have got a, a big enough distance between you and that person, even though you're walking together, you mm. can, because it's not going to move too far. I mean, it's, it's, you must remember it's happening, it's carried in those microscopic droplets coming from the other person's mouth or nose if they do not care, if they do not have the mask. But if you've got a mask together and you're working together, it's okay, I think. Mm, mm, mm. No, um, you know, there's somebody asking the question whether is uh, what we're seeing now is it realistic or is it uh, underreporting uh, in terms of the numbers? I, I, I know you did say earlier that uh, you know we should trust the numbers that we see um, as reflective of uh, what is happening. Um, but you know, judging by you know the inadequacies of our country, are we are we underreporting uh, or? No, I, I, th I don't think that we are underreporting um, because you see, we have done, uh, I think we have, we, we have actually done more tests in South Africa, comparatively speaking, than uh, some of the so called worst uh, first world countries. Actually, mm -hmm. I think Britain, I think the, the Western world has started to manipulate the data because it's starting to embarrass them. I mean, if you mm -hmm. look at Kenya and you look at the number of dying people, they are increasing now. This, the United States is about 50 countries. They talk as if they, they were, it's becoming an increasing problem. But you look at the number of deaths mm. that are affected per day, it's about 1,000 or 2,000. These are 50 countries. So yeah. it's not moving as fast as it's used to. So I think they're starting to manipulate the results there. Mm. In the UK, they've definitely manipulated them. The, 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 you can't really manipulate successfully the, the data of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of COVID because of the deaths of people and because mm. of, the, of, the, of the hospitalization. <clears throat> See what I mean? Because that is what you can't hide. If, if, you, if you look, I mean, people are telling me, I think it was Wade who told me uh, that Nasdaq was empty. And, yeah, and yeah. it's happening in other parts of the country as well, where all the arrangements that were made for hospitalization of people have turned out not to be <laughs> to be unnecessary, <laughs> have never been used. You see what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so yeah. I don't think there's been manipulation because you can't hide those things. Mm. But you know, the results cannot be completely accurate, and that is all over the world. That is all mm. over the world. Because mm. there are asymptomatic people, there are people who treat themselves at home. They are people who just recover without even treating themselves. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you can't have an exact data, but you can have trends. Is mm. the trend looking at more than the raw data that comes yeah, out? That's yeah, what they, yeah, yeah. You know, the people, the people, for instance, in the Eastern Cape, there was a time they reported 400 people. Now, mm. I take all this data every day that is in the keyboard, but I put them on a spreadsheet. Mm. Yeah, I so they reported 400 people died in the Eastern Cape on that day. It was a religious number. I know everybody was screaming, blah, blah. But the thing is, when you look at that, in the previous week, there have been like four people, 10 people, 10 people, and all of a sudden, and they give the impression that when the when they radio uh, uh, reports, they give the impression that <coughs> four people died in the previous 24 hours. Yeah, yeah, they don't yeah. say the people reported in the previous 24 hours. They say in the last 24 hours, 400 people died. So I mean, died, but yeah, yeah. the number that was reported in that 24 hours, mm, mm. Uh, this, the Cape Town has been the place where the, the reporting has been almost the same. The, the numbers in Cape Town have been like consistent, same range up on average. Whereas in Gauteng, the numbers increased every five days. In the Eastern Cape, every seven days, you suddenly have a big jump, which means mm. the reporting is, is is taking, you know, uh, or the reporting of deaths is not yeah, happening. Yeah. As it happens. Yeah. The mm. collection of data that's been that reported, but mm. they report in the news in a way that scares people. That all of a sudden we have four hundred people dying. You see what I mean? Mm. Mm. Um, so I just. Think the results have been manipulated because you can't, you can't really manipulate. You can't see, they, you can't hide dead people. You can't. <laughs> you, can't. You, know, and you never saw in South Africa people being abandoned, bodies being uh, abandoned, uh, uh, like uh, it uh. happened in South America. 
where what is you know, it says that we, we no longer hear of uh, you know deaths uh, due to HIV and AIDS. You know all the deaths are now about uh, COVID. It's about and, COVID, yeah. <laughs> and we don't hear anything else. And and one would wonder whether we're going to see the numbers that are reported uh, for you know the Spanish flu uh, because I mean if you go back to that history, they say about what five hundred million people died across the world um, as a result. Five hundred people died in the Spanish flu, and now it's three point six percent. The five hundred million people got infected, and fifty million of them died. Okay, okay, okay. So, so we're not going to go to those numbers. Well, we don't know. It's the still early stages for us. We're not even a year mm -hmm. into it, mm -hmm. so we don't know what's going to happen when the economy starts. Because mm. once the economy is that way, the, the, the damage happens once they once it opens because the, the workplace is another place that is. Mm, mm, mm. So, so what kind of normal should uh, black people, as we close off, should uh, black people uh, expect uh, after the, the this pandemic? I know for for others they will say, well, we'll have a new normal. But I mean, for black people, will there be a different normal? But that's what I was talking about, that the, what we should expect as, as Black people is that the people, the capitalists, who are, from, who are worried now about our situation of dying are going to cause more havoc than the pandemic because mm -hmm. these people, as they want to maximize profits, I tell you, the first sufferer of this thing is going to be labor. Yeah. So we can expect all sorts of things that are going to be done on labor to maximize profits and mm. people to recover from this. All sorts of things are going to be done uh, from reduced salaries to more working hours to a lot of pushing, fewer people doing uh, jobs of many. So all yeah. those things, that is the new normal that's going to happen. And it's going to be, you know, You've got, you've got to be happy that you've got a job. So many people don't have a job. So mm. we don't accept mm. all those things. That is, that is, it's not a new normal, really, for us. <laughs> so, so it's been like that, but it's just a different revolution. Yeah. 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 No, no, thanks. Uh, I, think, I think we should end it there uh, for today. And uh, thanks for your you know, thought-provoking uh, contribution to this discussion. Um, I look forward to, to next uh, weekend uh, weekend's discussion because I will be hosting Professor Kwan Di Kondlo. And we'll oh, be really? okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be discussing the new dawn, you know, the impact on governance, politics, and, and the economy. So I really look forward to that, uh, uh, that conversation. So, yeah. No, Thanks I hope much. we can join that. Um, no, no, most definitely. You must join. <laughs> He is also very excited about it. I'm also very excited about it. So I really uh, encourage everybody else to come and join us uh, next week for a discussion on the new dawn, uh, the impact on governance, politics, and economy. And that's the program for the next weekend. Is that question of lingering there about the AC2 receptors being uh, um, different genetically? I, I know I haven't seen uh, what to call um, evidence. Of, of okay. That. Okay. Uh, These are the receptors that uh, facilitate the infections. Mm, mm. Especially saying that there is uh, evidence. There's, I suppose there are reports showing that they they are different in the different populations: African, Caucasian, and Asiatic. Okay. Uh, and I and I don't think uh, that that can really be. Uh, 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 in this case, because you can't explain what's happening in Africa, because mm. you must remember mm. in America, it's affecting African Americans, and African Americans have got a very, almost identical genetic print as us in Africa. Yeah, yeah. They still yeah. have that. You know, they still have the, the, the genetic, what you call, with us. So, mm. what was happening to us would be replicated in them. 
No, no, thank you. And uh, thanks very much. Um, okay, uh, let's see each other next week then uh, for the new done discussion, um, you know, the impact on governance, politics and economy. Uh, Midweek, we have um, a, a memorial service or a commemoration service for Comrade Fezile Chume. You do know Fezile Chume. Uh, Comrade Fezile Chume, one of the you know stalwarts of the BC movement. Uh, I think uh, we'll be having that event on Tuesday evening at uh, 6 p.m. So we look forward to engaging you, um, you know, on Tuesday. And then for this discussion uh, next uh, Saturday, we will be handling the new dawn. Thank you very much. And thanks to Professor Ndwasa uh, for a great afternoon. Uh, goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Cheers, <laughs>